By 1836, a new world was dawning. The last 20 years had made it more daring, and many believed this was the start of something unprecedented in human history. Signs of this shift were everywhere. Early machines began to become more complex, replacing certain workers and giving new jobs to others. The steam engine was perfected in Afrikia and gave unnatural speed to some of their ships. The spinning jenny was invented in the cotton fields of Volkish America, making the slaves several times more profitable. And even the first hintings of trains began to be experimented with in the vast expanses of Russia. To reflect this air of progress, a flag referendum was petitioned to the nobility in order to change the flag from the medieval banner the Volksreich had been using for somewhere around a thousand years to something more indicative of a modern state, insofar as whatever that fairly new concept of modernity meant. As such, a new flag was drafted. It depicted a red, rampaging lion in a white circle on a matching red field. Such a flag represented a few things. It maintained the general color theme of the medieval banner while switching out the primitive, unruly wyvern for a noble yet refined beast in the classic lion. Placing it in the center of the flag and within a white disc also highlighted it and the monarchy it represented as the locus of the nation itself, the very foundational ethic upon which it now ran, what was called the noble spirit of the Volksreich. This new age brought with it a re-evaluation of the great powers, as new tools to accrue power had come to light, and so too had new ways to properly measure and evaluate that metric. This new method was based mainly around prestige, industry, and military might. At the head of the pack was Aquitania, a country of 13 million people under King Philippe V Croilon. An absolute monarchy with an empire that dominated the North Atlantic, they had holdings in Haiti, Greenland, and most of the Mid-Atlantic East Coast in America, a place they called Florida. Partially by right of their imperial distribution, they dominated the tobacco, rum, and fur trades. Having also wrested the so-called Pillars of Hercules from Afrikia, also meant that they dominated the rest of North Atlantic trade, upon which they founded a massive fleet and bolstered their land army, both to protect themselves and project their power. It was this confluence of events which led to Aquitania sitting as the premier power of 1836. They were characterized mostly by a hopefulness amongst the well-to-do classes, and a general sense amongst them that Aquitania was only just beginning its steps into a future brighter than any could imagine. This expressed itself in their prevailing culture, which pursued themes of natural glory, ancient heroism, and general societal positivity. Next was the Magyarsag, a nation of 19 million souls under Emperor Kelemen Van Kura, which had become total master of the Black Sea, having overcome Russia and Lakandu in their most recent conflicts with them. Their imperial holdings also included South Africa, though that was the extent of their colonies. The Magyarsak was characterized by militarism, ethnic nationalism, and sense of duty pursuant to the goal of expansion of their homeland and the exaltation of the crown which lorded over it. They also continued the tradition of regular state-sanctioned pogroms against various, increasingly small, minority groups. This cruelty towards the foreigner was going to be a distinct mark of the Magyar people and would make them a fearsome enemy, perhaps the most fearsome in all Europe. Next was the Volksreich, an empire of 24 million souls under Kaiser Erhard the Vorth von Formbach. The most populous country in Europe, the Volksreich presided over most of the continent, as well as vast central swaths of North and South America, which allowed it to participate in, if not dominate, the various trades and activities that took place as a result of access to those markets. It even managed to colonize remote sections of the world in the Aleutian Islands and Cameroon. Despite its seat at the table of the Great Powers, and the fact that it would be a dreadful foe to face in battle, it was obvious that this power was an old power. A strength that comes with time and with struggles, not with talent or skill. It was rough and inflexible, and in a time of renovation, many thought it would never survive. The decline of the Volksreich since the reign of Siegfried in the 14th century was steady yet glacial in its pace, 
and this was but a singular plot on its progression towards total structural failure. At least, this was the general consensus amongst its neighbors at the time. The nobility was doing better than ever, and the power of the crown to dominate its people was unlike that of any despot of Europe or Asia. Time would tell if this brutal force would be enough to outlast the Age of Steam. Holding to the middle of the Great Powers was the Ming Empire, made up of an astounding 97 million people under Emperor Zhengqi. The Ming were the Asiatic counter to European strength, though in many ways they mirrored the Volksreich specifically. They were characterized by an old power, they colonized North America and East Siberia, the Emperor Zhengqi had near total control over his realm, and the nobility were both inflexible yet hardly permitted to even think for themselves. Though, of course, the Ming were not quite as hemmed in as the Volksreich. Their Pacific hegemony much more resembled the maritime prestige of Aquitania and the Atlantic, by way of Ming Siberia, Ming America, and Ming Hawaii acting in conjunction with the Chinese coast to hand deliver them almost total authority over those waters. Japan and Korea worked in tandem to counter the Ming, though it was only enough to keep either of them from getting invaded. Still, this old power of theirs was also rigid, and the hopes of her regional enemies lay in the fiery engines of industrialism. Holding the fifth spot were the Aksu, a loose confederation of 21 million people under Khan Ankajagral Sarangral. The Aksu were technically an absolute monarchy, but it would be difficult to call them a united polity. In the Indian subcontinent, where they had made the most inroads, Khan Ankajagral indeed had direct control and was able to make piecemeal advances against the nations of the Paschemi Dol Alliance, which now officially had too much on its plate. However, north of the Himalayas, one encounters the sparsely populated Badlands, controlled by warlords and bandits, nominally sanctioned by the Khan in the south. Their dominion over Central Asia made land trade across it nearly impossible for those not directly in their good graces, leaving only a difficult route from Al Kufa to Sogd to Kazakh to the Ming for those merchants or realms the Aksu disliked. In the last 20 years, they had also made advances into Russia with the help of the ethnically Russian Kolgik Nar, many of whom were the main presiding Aksu warlords north of the Himalayas. They could hardly be called civilized, but their crude system functioned well enough to make them a force to be reckoned with, as medieval as that force may be. Next, Ireland, a nation of 11 million people under Emperor Quill Vogan, was lord of the Isles and prided itself on having one of the largest colonial empires, from Florida to Brazil and to the African Gulf. Ireland was another absolute monarchy, though they were characterized by their pursuit of internal culture. Many great works of fiction began to emerge from the Isles, and certain facets of their culture began to take shape during the early 19th century, like the drinking of coffee, elaborate lunches, and beautifully crafted private spaces, placing special emphasis on the emotional warmth of living rooms, bedrooms, and studies. They utilized their African colonies for the growth of coffee and the cultivation of dark woods for use in the home country. Their architects were in the greatest of demand, and a combination of all these cultural factors ensured that the Irish Empire was the first major example of global soft power at work. Even the Ming Emperor had a mahogany chest carved in County Cork. Next, the Russian Empire, a realm of 11 million souls under Tsar Maxim Blatimil, was in the throes of crisis. The prior Tsar, Isislav IV, had gotten rather cocky after his victory in the Twenty Years' War and started a handful of devastating conquests he did not live to see finished, leaving Tsar Maxim with the mess. The harshest factor of this crisis was that the population of Russia had actually continued to decline after the Twenty Years' War, going from 13 million to 11 million since the conclusion of the conflict due to war, starvation, and minor rebellion. Regardless, the Russian generals were second to none, and in their immense skill and tenacity, they were able to maintain Russia's place as a player on the world stage. Internally, its culture was much the same as it had been since the 1700s, and that is a small, aristocratic elite presiding over a generally illiterate horde of common folk with a vanishingly small cast of middle-class specialists. Finally, and perhaps most surprisingly, was Lakandu, a kingdom of a mere 400,000 souls under Sultanos Shabazz Rashid al-Mustakas, a realm of Greek Sunni Muslims 
Their territory, once encompassing the Holy Lands and most of Anatolia, was cut down to its present state, in the most part by Magyarorsog. The Kandu clung to the eastern Mediterranean, but at first glance one is unable to see how they could have outranked the grand empires of Alençon or Afrikia. Upon closer inspection, it becomes clear. The Kandu had begun to toy with the Afrikian steam engine, and certain enterprising minds had put it to use in various applications beyond simple propulsion. One of the major applications was to fuel deeply complex textile machines, fed by Volkish cotton and their own local wool, leading to Lacandian textiles flooding the European market. While not of any particular quality, they had pulled off an economy of scale that no other kingdom had yet been able to achieve. Time would tell if their early adoption of industry would be enough to make up for their size, population, and lack of natural resources. Whatever awaited them in the future, for the moment, they sat amongst the great powers. Other notable powers, namely Alençon and Afrikia, were struggling. Alençon had recently lost Argentina, and their sizable Yusufid minority meant that they had established good relations with the sparse islander people that the Yusufids had become. Euphrikia was reeling, as they had been robbed of their most valuable asset by Aquitania, and without the Pillars of Hercules, they were to put their vast centuries of wealth to use, boring deep into Africa, seeking to establish new territories on the coast further south, and in this endeavor they were largely successful. Mali proved unable to hold them back, and the Afrikians set up Morocco, which was threatened by Aquitania, as well as Afrikian South Africa, which was threatened by the Magyars, and Afriki in West Africa, threatened by the Irish Gulf Colony and the Tio tribe, who the Irish did business with. The Kazembe tribe entered into trade with Afriki, countering the Tio tribe and also allowing the Afrikians to make a helot army, made up of Tio slaves who were promised freedom to fight their former tribe. Iceland in the far north had claimed the Great Lakes for itself, and though for now the frigid regions they managed to claim were only good for fur and fish, Sometime in the near enough future, Vinland would be awash with oil. Kiev was still a dual theocratic monarchy, though having the most unique government made them by no means exceptionally powerful. Ever since the schism between the Albigensian denominations, they had slipped further into obscurity, yet remained stubbornly and resolutely alive. The Magyarsog and Russia had made constant war against them, but not yet had either of them managed to wipe this holy kingdom off the face of the earth. Many of their subjects considered this a miracle. Newer states making themselves known included Cambodia, which had challenged the Paschemi Dole, won, and used that power to posture itself against the Ming. The Shia Muslims of Al Kufa also notably conquered the Fatimids, relegating them to a totally oceanic existence, where they made ties with Malacca and the Philippines, aligning themselves against Brunei, who themselves were working with Cambodia to protect their southern flank. Pasai was a quiet colonizer, yet made a name for itself as the largest presence in Australia and the first to make it to Alaska, which was now a rather crowded affair. The same could be said of their presence in Mexico. They didn't bother anybody, and in turn, they were unbothered by them. Eva aligned themselves against the emboldened Cambodia, but as Buddhists they were not allowed in the Hindu-only Paschemi Dal alliance, and so deals with the Ming Emperor were their only way of aligning themselves against this rival. Finally, the Republic of Colombia in South America found itself in the unfriendliest of company. Nearly no European power with an empire to protect wished to trade with them, so they were relegated to selling coffee to Southeast Asia and the Aksu. Colombia was thusly impoverished. They had their freedom, though the starving masses couldn't fill their stomachs on it. In summation, the 19th century got off to a tense and electric start, characterized by anachronisms and innovations. History would be watching as the world of man decided which path it would take. <laughs>